Welcome to Environment Halliburton's event on how our pensions can be fueling the climate crisis. My name is Christine Legg and I'm filling in tonight for Susan Hay, Environment Halliburton's president. I would like to begin by giving a land acknowledgement with a bit of a fresh take to it. Stan Rushworth, an indigenous elder of Cherokee descent, reminds us of the difference between a Western settler mindset of I have rights and an indigenous mindset of I have obligations. Instead of thinking that I was born with rights, I choose to think I am born with obligations to serve past, present, and future generations and the planet herself. Let's keep Mr. Rushworth's advice in mind as we listen to our speakers tonight. Can I please ask that you click on your mute button if you haven't already, so we don't pick up any background noise that may distract the speaker's presentation. And now I will turn the meeting over to Terry Moore, our Vice President, who will introduce our speakers. Uh, thank you, Christine. Good, good evening, everybody. Uh, just before I introduce tonight's presenters, I wanna say just a couple of things about uh, comments and questions. We're asking you to use the chat function to make your any comments or questions that come to, to mind as you uh, as you're listening to the presentation tonight, and um, after the presentations, I'll curate and reference those comments and questions, um, and perhaps putting some of them together if they touch on common themes, and then ask the presenters to to uh, to respond. So please do that even during the meeting, so that you can you know as questions arise, you can put them in the chat box. Um, so. Um, we're pleased to have three presenters this evening with an organization that's really pioneered holding pension plans and fund managers accountable for the climate impl implications of their investment decisions. While not all of us have workplace-based pension plans, all of us have an interest in the operation of the Canada Pension Plan. To share their knowledge and experience about the relationship between our pensions and the climate emergency, we have Adam Scott, Shifts Director, uh, Britt, uh, Ronicles Shifts, BC Pensions Campaigner, and Laura McGrath Shifts, Pension Engagement Manager, uh, with us this evening. Adams, Adam is a climate change expert with extensive domestic and international experience in policy, energy, and finance, as well as campaign design and execution. At Shift, he works with a wide ranging uh, with wide ranging stakeholders to bring international climate leadership into Canada's financial sector. Britt is a passionate advocate for climate action and strong believer in the power of pension funds to play a leading role in the transition to a zero carbon economy. A graduate of the University of British Columbia, they have experience organizing and campaigning on university divestment and reinvestment campaigns. Laura works with networks of pension beneficiaries who want to understand and communicate their pension to their pension funds and the financial risks posed by climate change. She has supported working and, and she, working and retired municipal professionals, health care professionals, and more to engage with their pension funds on the climate crisis. Please join me in welcoming Adam, Britt, and Laura to tonight's Enviro Cafe. Over to you, folks. Adam, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. I'm <laughs> talking and just trying to get my uh, screen shared there. Thanks, everybody, uh, for coming and spending some of your Tuesday night uh, learning about pensions and climate change. Uh, I'm Adam with Shift, and uh, Shift is a, an organization that helps pension members understand how the climate crisis poses a risk to their pension funds and analyzes and tracks how pension funds are handling these risks. So um, I'm gonna talk for the first little part of the presentation um, about how the climate crisis poses a risk to our pensions uh, and the financial sort of side of that. And my colleague, Laura is gonna talk to you about the approach uh, the Canada Pension Plan specifically is taking to manage these risks and what more it should do. And my colleague, Britt, uh, will wind things up by telling you what you can do about it and how you can get more involved and have an impact here. 
Um, so to set the stage for the conversation, I'll start off by saying, you know, your pension savings, uh, whether they're uh, privately held or in a pension fund or in Canada pension plan are invested all across the economy, across the globe. They're invested in real estate, public and private companies, utilities and industry and energy. Um, and that means pension funds are exposed all across the economy to risks posed by the climate crisis. Um, it also means that how pension funds themselves act on climate has a huge impact on to how quickly we can transition our economy um, so that we'll actually be able to have a stable climate in the future. Uh, so here's the topics we're going to cover tonight quickly. Um, first and foremost, first and foremost, uh, really want you to understand that the climate is impacted by your pension. Um, I want you to understand that your pension is affected by the climate crisis um, and our attempts to address it. And lastly, it's really important that you understand how much power you have to make change uh, in how your pension fund approaches the climate crisis. Um, we've been doing this for a while now at Shift, and we've seen quite uh, a change over time in how the pension funds are talking about this issue. So I'll say off the bat, you know, Canada's 10 largest pension funds, which we track uh, quite closely, have over $2.2 trillion Canadian in assets under management. So these funds, as I said, they own the whole real economy that we live in. Um, every working and uh, retired Canadian, if you don't have a personal pension fund as part of Canada Pension Plan, Canada Pension Plan manages $576 billion worth of assets, more than half a trillion right now. Um, and so is one of the largest asset owners in the world. So obviously the decisions on where they invest that capital, where that flows through the, the wider economy has a huge impact on our success or failure to address the climate crisis and to transition our economy to zero emissions as quickly as possible. So um, I'm gonna quickly you know, kick off with the context on the climate crisis. I always do that to make sure we're sort of starting on the right foot here. And then I'll quickly move on to sort of the impacts for your pension. So this graph, uh, shows the growth in the burning of coal, oil, and gas since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is carbon that was previously trapped safely in the ground. It's been dumped into the atmosphere through combustion, and it has had a very substantial change to uh, our atmosphere. This is a graph of global atmospheric carbon dioxide over the same period, and you can see um, the amount of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere has increased by more than 60% in a very short period of time. Uh, primarily due to that change in, in burning fossil fuels. And this has had a devastating impact already um, on our climate. And we're feeling the impacts of the warming that this has caused all around the world. Um, it's been increasing the in frequency and intensity of floods and fires and heat waves and droughts and extreme weather of all types. Um, and the crisis is really threatening the interconnected global systems that support us, our ecosystems and our economies. So this is a heating trend um, that is still accelerating. We're still growing the amount of emissions that we put into the atmosphere every year globally. And without an immediate and unprecedented intervention, we will quickly lock into a future with very unthinkable consequences for ecosystems, economies, and communities. So I think Folks uh, taking their time out of their Tuesday night to come in and think a bit more about this. I think you're all likely well aware of everything I've just said. Um, but I think it's it's important to keep that in mind while we're talking about what we can do about it. This graph, I always like to show, um, and it gives us a sense of what the path out of the crisis looks like. The black line is historical emissions to date, roughly. And the different paths down the curve and different down the curve in different colors show um, what, what's needed to stay below a one and a half degree threshold. And so you can see, had we started many, many years ago, the path would have been much smoother and gentler. We would have had longer to get to zero emissions. Um, but now we have to reach zero emissions very quickly. Um, and every year we delay uh, makes this more challenging. So it's really important to, to understand we're not trying to just reduce emissions. That's sort of an outdated concept of how to address the climate crisis. We're not just trying to marginally cut our emissions and, and feel good about that. What we need to think is systemically about what a path to zero emissions looks like. So we have to think a little bit longer term. Um, there's no path that doesn't have us hitting zero emissions um, for, the, for the sort of climate safety 
trajectories. And the second thing I want you to remember is that there's a serious cost uh, to inaction. This gets harder, more expensive, uh, and more difficult to do every year we delay. So transitions of this magnitude can't come from just government decisions. We need everywhere that there's capital being allocated in our society to be making decisions with this climate frame in mind. Uh, it's incredibly important. So obviously, what does that all have to do with pensions? Um, that this crisis we're facing is an existential threat to the financial health of pension funds. Even today, uh, we're seeing headwinds to the growth of the global economy from climate impacts that we've just been experiencing over the last couple of years. Um, and in particular, if we're thinking about younger members who are joining pension funds now, pension funds have to be able to pay out 20, 30, 40 years out uh, their pensions, and they need that growth in order to be able to do that. And so the, the very sort of idea of a pension is that threat um, alongside the climate crisis. And as I already mentioned, uh, pension funds are some of the most important allocators of capital. So um, we need them to be making these decisions now. Um, yeah, I'm just going to keep moving quickly here. I also didn't want to blow through the moral case uh, for ending investment in fossil fuels, which I'll get into a bit more. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the financial risks involved um, for pension funds because pension funds have a legal fiduciary responsibility. Um, but it's important not to skip over the fact that this is a very much a moral issue as well about generational equity. Um, and we need to remember that. Um, this can't be intergenerational theft um, of the future. We need to do what we can now. Uh, if, if you're retired today, you know, you're know you not thinking about your own pension in the future. You're thinking about the, the pensions of others as well and, and the future of the planet. So I mentioned fiduciary duty. I'll talk about that in a bit more detail now. Pensions have a legal responsibility to invest in the best long-term interest of pension members, of beneficiaries. Um, and this is what guides all of their decision-making. So they have to minimize risk and maximize return with a goal that uh, they'll be able to pay out pensions way down the line. So very long-term thinking. Um, and for a long time, pensions didn't think this was, you know, uh, this actually, uh, the climate crisis applied to them because they're saying, look, we are only financial. We don't care about other environmental issues. Why, why should we care about climate? And it's become clear that as the climate crisis is such a strong financial risk to pension funds that it is actually absolutely part of their fiduciary duty to act. And here's why. I'm going to go through, we've sort of uh, loosely put these in five different buckets, but you could add a lot more of them. These are the different types of climate-related financial risk that, that we're dealing with here right now. Um, so the first category is physical risk uh, from a warming world. So I mentioned you know, increased fires, floods, heat waves, droughts, sea level rise, extreme weather. They damage the fundamental infrastructure, utilities um, that underpin our economy, and they are a huge risk to things like real estate, utilities, roads, bridges, airports, um, agriculture, and infrastructure, which makes up a very substantial portion of pension fund holdings. In particular, real estate is just a huge part of the portfolios of all the major pension funds, and they're already seeing um, great physical impacts and much higher insurance costs and all sorts of other sort of rippling effects. So they're feeling this one and, and the pensions are largely paying attention to physical risk. The second category is a little trickier to understand and this is the, the transition risk. So when I showed that really sharp fall off graph, um, what we were really looking at is an unprecedented transition in our energy systems. And we've been through transitions like this before, and I'm showing the horse and buggy as an example of a quick transition that occurred between the use of horses and cars um, at the turn of the last century. Uh, but you can think of you know, film cameras to digital cameras or blockbuster video rentals to Netflix. Those are sorts of examples of quick transitions that were not easy to predict. And so if you're an investor and you're not really paying attention, it's very easy to lose a lot of money. So we're talking about um, clean energy, wind and solar are now cheaper than any other forms of electricity. Um, and policies on climate are pushing them forward faster. We've got electric vehicles, energy storage, energy efficiency, uh, you know, things like heat pumps for your home. These are all having a disruptive impact on incumbent industries. 
And let me tell you, your pensions are heavily invested in those incumbent industries. Companies like Enbridge that uh, make money on gas networks are already facing disruption from the switch to heat pumps in Ontario. This is a, already a live issue for them, but investors aren't clued into it. So this is a very substantial financial risk. And we often talk about stranded assets as, as one of those ca categories. Uh, regulatory risk. So obviously addressing the climate crisis requires a lot more policy than we have right now. So really aggressive carbon pricing, electric vehicle policies, banning internal combustion engines. I could go on and on. Capping um, oil and gas emissions in Canada is a live issue right now. Um, these are all going to have a really big impact and there are winners and losers in the economy. Um, and we need to be prepared and thinking of, about that regulation has to get stronger in the future. Legal and reputational risks. Um, this is another sleeper issue perhaps, but oil and gas companies in particular are um, have been uh, actively fighting climate regulation. Um, it's one of the major reasons why getting climate regulation is so difficult. They're actively lobbying aggressively everywhere. And they're also uh, intentionally lying to the public about possible solutions. And uh, they lied about climate science for many years. And so there's a lot of evidence and there's been an increasing number of lawsuits uh, from municipalities, from states in the US, uh, from uh, young people in Ontario uh, against fossil fuel producers. And I think um, this is a huge liability. So it's really good to think about oil and gas in the same context that we do for tobacco industry in the 90s. There are hundreds of billions of dollars in legal liabilities on the table here. And this is just starting to ramp up. But I think, you know, the category we, we pay attention least to is the most important one. And that is the sort of some total effect of all of these risks on the greater financial system. So um, the climate change itself, it, you know, has this cascading impact. We're not talking about one thing happening at one time. We're talking about problems with the food system. We're talking about, you know, damage to our infrastructure. We can't get insurance. Uh, we're having wildfire fire impacts. So we're all trapped in our homes because of smoke. All of these things um, happening at the same time causes systemic impact and systemic risk to the financial system. And so this is what will lead to um, a worsening, uh, basically a shrinking of the global economy uh, relative to where it would be and a drag on GDP growth, which is incredibly important for financial institutions and markets. And so this is the, the fundamental reason why pension funds are legally required to be acting on climate change and to be part of the solution, not just to play defense and pick and choose which stocks they buy, but to actually try to invest in the solutions to this crisis. And they have to work together with each other and with governments um, and other large institutions to try to uh, impact this, this crisis. So this is all you know, very big um, and scary risks we're talking about. It's not all risk though, and it's not all a negative story. That transition I talked about uh, very much has an upside and that transition is disruption by clean technology, um, by better ways of living that have um, profitable and, and frankly, um, incre incredibly important health impacts. Um, so investing in renewable energy and electrification of transportation and electrification of heating in efficiency, building efficiency, all of these things, if we invest across the economy and bring everybody along with us, hugely profitable, exponential growth, um, trillions in dollars in opportunity, um, Different, we, I've got different numbers on my, my slide here, but uh, BlackRock, the largest investor in the world, calls this a $10 trillion investment opportunity. There are all sorts of numbers like that. But the, the fact of the matter is, if you want to invest in something today that has exposure to exponential growth, invest in climate solutions. Um, and we, we've seen already that that's happening. Um, solar power is already just taking off right now. Batteries... Uh, wind, heat pumps, these things are the technologies that are taking over quickly. So, um, yeah, I think that's sort of my overview of the climate risk uh, and, and the reason why we care so much about pensions and, and why you should as well. I wanted to show you this slide. These are the pension fund managers that we mostly focus on. Um, we said that these collectively have over 2.2 trillion in assets. Um, 
And it'd be great if you took a moment right now to uh, everybody who's on the call, just to let us know which of any of these are you members of, um, just so we get a bit better sense who's in the room and um, what kind of interest there is in different pension funds. As we highlighted here, uh, all of us um, in Ontario are members of Canada Pension Plan as well. So we're going to spend a bit of an extra time in the next few minutes focusing on that. Laura's going to go deep on CPIB. But we'd be happy to sort of, especially in the question parts, we can talk about others as well, if that's useful. Um, so what are we looking for from a pension fund? What, is it, what does the climate action for them mean? And we tend to look at roughly six uh, indicators. Do they have a target, an actual plan uh, to actually you know, align with trying to limit global heating as close as we can to one and a half degrees? Um, so we'll, we'll, this is expressed in 2050 by, uh, sorry, net zero by 2050 commitments, usually by financial institutions. Do they have near-term targets? So are there decisions being made today actually in line with that long-term goal? So every single investment decision they should be making today in the boardroom, we need to hold them accountable. And so for that, we need five-year terms, you know, 2025, 2030. That's what near-term targets look like, and they have to be aligned. Do they recognize the urgency of the crisis? Do they understand that pensions are a critical piece of the pie and that they won't be able to meet their obligations without it? We need them to say that out loud. Climate integration covers a whole lot of smaller sort of internal processes, but it's basically, have they mainstreamed climate thinking and expertise throughout the organization? The biggest one we look for is um, as they compensate their staff, like executives, uh, are there bonuses tied to meeting climate targets? That's a key way that you can ensure that an institution of this kind is actually taking this seriously. Climate engagement is uh, refers to the power that pension funds have over the companies they own. They have tremendous power to be able to tell them how to operate, and to put them onto a transition pathway as well. Um, and so we need to see them engaging. So that's voting on proxy votes, that's calling up them up, that's appointing board members. There's a lot of influence that pension fund can have on, on their companies. And there are some companies that no amount of engagement will change or eliminate the risk. And that's fossil fuels. So we, we think climate engagement is incredibly important, but we also feel very strongly that um, they should not be allocating new capital into fossil fuels and they should be winding down um, their investments in fossil fuels going forward. And that's because of risk and it's because of the climate. And we'll, we can talk more about that. Quick snapshot. This is from our, our report card that we put out last year, which uh, measured all of these for all of the large pension funds. We're three weeks out, two weeks out from releasing our next, our second version of this. So you can watch for that soon. Um, but this is last year and you can see Canada Pension Plan there getting a pretty middling grade. Um, failing to uh, to get a really high overall score and failing completely on interim targets and fossil fuel exclusions. Um, and we can get more into that as well. So at this point, you know, I've given my uh, sort of overview talk and all of that, but it's good to get a sense in the room about where you're at as well in terms of thinking about these issues. Um, and we often ask folks to sort of rate what's the reaction to this statement that we've put up on the screen. So Terry was going to uh, share a poll for everybody. Just to, honest answers are totally good. Just curious where you're at in understanding um, or thinking about uh, fossil fuels and and, fossil, and pension uh, investments. And for after that, we can run that poll. I don't know if that's working. And while we're doing that, I can hand it over to my colleague, Laura, who can talk uh, to the second part of this webinar where we'll talk about Canada Pension Plan. So this, these are the questions, or this is the question as it stands. And uh, we can just, we can, sorry, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, you wanna pass it over? <laughs> okay. I'll pass it over. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Yeah, um, and yeah, you can scroll ahead there. Um, and Terry, you can close the poll when you're ready. We'll come back to it a bit later, maybe to see the results. I just 
couldn't see it. That was why I was pushing it. Yeah, I think just because we're co-hosts. So with Adam's introduction on why the pension funds are a critical lever for climate action, I'll do take us through a deep dive into Canada's largest pension fund, the Canada Pension Plan. Uh, We do cover at Shift uh, a bunch of other pensions, and I saw a lot of them in the chat there. So happy to talk about those two. But for this main part, we're just going to try to focus on the pension applicable to the most of us. So if you are working uh, outside of Quebec, a portion of every one of your paychecks goes into the ZBP. And if you're retired, you can collect a pension from the ZBP. So it's applicable to 21 million Canadians. Uh, So as Adam said, the, the CPP, you might hear me say CPP or CPPIB or CPP investments. We're talking about the same thing here. So CPPIB means Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. You see that on the top of the slide. Um, it's, it's one of the largest funds in the world, one of the largest investors with over half a trillion dollars. And that money that goes off, comes off paychecks throughout your working life isn't enough on its own to pay out your pension. It has to grow over time and earn returns so that there's going to be enough money to pay out pensions. So that that money doesn't just sit there, but it's invested all over the place. Um, You'll see on this slide, the Canada Pension Plan owns real estate, port, airports, highways, all sorts of companies. And it has this really clear mandate that's spelled out in legislation to invest the assets of the Canada Pension Fund with a view to achieving a maximum rate of return without undue risk of loss. Uh, but this is your money put aside for you, invested on your behalf. And uh, and it's, it's a lot of money that the Canada Pension Plan is investing on, on your behalf. Um, so as Adam showed you, they had this, this middling grade, despite uh, the size and sophistication of the Canada Pension Plan. It was in the middle overall when we did our report card last year. Um, we also gave the Canada Pension Plan a greenwashing award because we identified a pattern of the fund making its investment activities appear to be more environmentally friendly or less environmentally damaging than they really are. Um, And as Adam said, we'll be updating this report card in the next couple of weeks so you can watch for for this year's grades. Um, But credit where credit is due, the Canada Pension Plan has taken significant positive steps, particularly in the last couple of years to understand climate risk, um, to implement an effective response to the climate crisis. It has a climate plan now. Um, It's put out a number of think pieces on the energy transition and decarbonization. And that's what you see on your screen there. So I'm gonna talk through as we go, I'll talk through some of the good and bad of what the Canada Pension Plan has done so far. It has growing investments in renewable energy. You see the the bar graph showing how it's written, risen quite quickly over time. Uh, And the Canada Pension Plan owns its own renewable energy companies. It finances and builds wind farms and utility scale solar all over the world. It has a portfolio of green certified buildings. So in these many ways, we see that the Canada Pension Plan is realizing there's a big demand for decarbonization and is making smart investment decisions to help uh, decarbonize carbon intensive industries and providing its capital to help find pathways to decarbonize. This slide, there's a lot of words here, so I'll just talk us through it one by one, but with each thing, I'm gonna talk through the good and the bad of what the Canada Pension Plan's doing. So it's committed to have net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 but doesn't have any commitments for 2025 or 2030. So there isn't anything that Canadians can use to measure progress to say, are you on track? We have no way of holding the Canada Pension Plan accountable for reducing the greenhouse gas emissions of all those companies that it owns. Uh, It has this investment commitment to have 130 billion invested in green and transition assets by 2030. It's already at 79 billion. Um, And this commitment, it lumps together different assets with different risk profiles. We see this at a few places in the Canada Pension Plan. The fund also has a portfolio that it calls sustainable energies. And if you go and look at that sustainable energy section of the CPP's website, you'll see traditional energy, that's fossil fuels alongside renewables all lumped together. So the way things are classified obfuscates um, how the Canada Pension Plan is investing and where the investments are in real climate solutions. 
Uh, the third, oh, still on the same slide, Adam. The tools to support decarbonization. The third item here is uh, that the Canada Pension Plan has developed a framework that it's using with portfolio companies to help them understand where they can reduce, reduce emissions and what it will cost and when it becomes, um, like at what price points it becomes attractive to do and what to do if it isn't. That's great to see. Uh, they've run that framework with about 12 portfolio companies. Uh, but haven't disclosed what decarbonization pathways they're finding or how they're going to decarbonize uh, industries that are really hard, where that's really hard to do. Two more points here. One is that pension funds, all of them, they own shares in public companies. So that means when that public company has its annual meeting, the pension fund can come vote. It can vote on any resolutions that are put forward. So we like to see how pension funds are saying, what do they say about how they will vote on climate proposals that are put forward at annual meetings? And the Canada Pension Plan has some, some good wording in its proxy voting guidelines about how it's going to vote. But when we've looked at its voting records, we see that it's, it's not consistently voting for climate-related proposals. It's not consistently voting against company directors that haven't aligned their companies on climate. And finally, while it has these large investments in climate solutions, the Canada Pension Plan also has more than 21 billion invested in oil and gas producers uh, and is, uh, is still buying up oil and gas producers. So we'll talk about that as we move on. This is a snapshot of public companies that the Canada Pension Plan owns shares in. So these are companies on the stock market. Um, and the, the thing to note about these companies is that for all of them, their financial success depends on expanding and prolonging the use of fossil fuels. The combustion of fossil fuels is driving the climate crisis. So for these companies to succeed financially, we have to be looking at a future of climate disaster. Like that's just, the two things don't really go together. Um, if these companies succeed, it undermines our collective retirement security and the Canada Pension Plan's own mandate. So what we hear from the Canada Pension Plan and other pension funds is that it has to own these companies in order to influence them and engage them to lower their emissions. Uh, but there isn't a way for these companies to align with that curve Adam showed early on of, of getting to net zero emissions. The, their business model is to extract and refine and transport fossil fuels, so they don't have a way to align with net zero. Um, the only way they can do that is by phasing out production. And yet yeah, we've seen that the Canada Pension Plan makes considerable public statements signaling that it's going to prop up the fossil fuel industry and paints it as part of the energy transition. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, last year, when the Canada Pension Plan released its sustainable investing report, the report and accompanying materials rejected fossil fuel divestment 11 different times. Uh, a couple of months ago, the Canada Pension Plan CEO was in Calgary. He said that the fund was going to look for additional investment opportunities in Alberta in traditional energy. Uh, and just last year, the Canada Pension Plan financed fossil fuel expansion and bought a 49% stake in California's second largest oil producer. On um, the next slide, we've got a couple examples of media articles uh, with some of what we've heard from different spokespeople at the Canada Pension Plan. Uh, and also the Globe and Mail op-ed, which was written by uh, one of my colleagues who's not here tonight, because we have to ask the question, well, why? Why is our national pension fund still heavily invested in fossil fuels, and, and why won't it acknowledge that we need to phase out fossil fuels? So here are some potential explanations why. Um, one explanation is that the Canada Pension Plan outright owns, privately owns fossil fuel companies and infrastructure all over the world. So it's pretty hard to acknowledge the need for a fossil fuel phase out when it owns oil rigs and pipelines and fossil fuel export facilities. Um, I'll give you just a brief description of some of the companies you see here. So the Canada Pension Plan is a 43% stake in Neffen Energy, which extracts gas off the coast of Ireland, 90% uh, in Tyne, a private oil and gas developer in Western Canada, uh, a 50% stake in the largest exporter of fossil gas in Peru, which transports fracked gas from the Amazon. And as I said, in March last year, bought a 49 stake in ERA Energy, which is responsible for a quarter of California oil production. 
And maybe another reason why the Canada Pension Plan doesn't want to acknowledge that fossil fuels must be phased out is that its own board of directors is entangled with the fossil fuel industry. So of 12 directors on the Canada Pension Plan board, four of them are also sitting as directors at fossil fuel companies. Uh, another two have longstanding connections to the Royal Bank of Canada, uh, one of the largest financiers of fossil fuels in the world. So uh, we asked the question of ourselves, you know, do we expect these people who've made careers out of serving oil and gas companies to make the right decision when it comes to the climate crisis? I also want to highlight, and probably this is topical coming on the, the heels of the SCAN webinar that, that you were telling us that you did earlier, um, we looked in the report card to see if pension funds have Indigenous rights policy or if they're saying anything about how they consider Indigenous rights in their investment decisions. And we have seen some pension funds um, say a little bit more about this, have a bit more wording in their policies over the last year, and that will be reflected in our upcoming report card. But nothing from the Canada Pension Plan. There's no public statement on how they factor Indigenous rights into their investment process. Uh, and this is a Crown Corporation. The Government of Canada has legislation in place um, honoring the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So one of the things we call for in the report card is that pension funds, including the CPP, um, need to make it a requirement that companies they own obtain and maintain free prior and informed consent from Indigenous peoples uh, for investment activities that affect them. We have uh, just a summary slide here. So these are all things that the Canada Pension Plan has to do to have a credible climate plan. Green is something it's done. Yellow, something that's in progress. Uh, but there's a lot here where the Canada Pension Plan needs to catch up. Uh, we need some, some near-term 2025, 2030 targets so that we can hold our national pension manager accountable for making progress. Um, a, an immediate screen on any new investment in fossil fuels in line with climate science. We've heard this um, since 2021 um, from the International Energy Agency. A, a net zero pathway means no new investment in fossil fuel expansion. They need to have stronger requirements on the companies they own on climate, and they need to institute an Indigenous rights policy. Now, of course, people want to know, what, what does this mean for my pension? Can, um, are we going to lose money? Can we still make money? So I just want to show you this uh, research from Corporate Knights. It's been done two years in a row, and it looked at how pension funds would have done if 10 years ago they had eliminated investments in the oil and gas companies on the stock market. And for every one of the funds examined, these are all Canadian pensions here, um, the returns in that portfolio of publicly traded companies, it, they would have been higher if fossil fuels had been divested from 10 years ago. So divestment from fossil fuels, it's a way to reduce risk and volatility, and it, it's simply a smart financial decision. And other investors are realizing this. So there's already over $40 trillion uh, in investments where the investment manager has a complete or a partial exclusion on fossil fuels. And these include um, the Quebec public pension manager. It's divested from oil producers and screens out any new investment in oil producers. The largest pension fund in Europe, which won't invest in fossil fuel companies and is phasing out those investments. New York City, the Dutch Healthcare Pension, the Church of England Pensions Board. So the Canada Pension Plan, it's way behind on this. And we're, we're seeing other investors doing all the things that we just talked about and Canada Pension Plan needs to do those things too. So I'm gonna hand things now over to my colleague, Brett, to talk about what you can do to help the Canada Pension Plan catch up and get on track. Thanks, Laura. So we'll be pasting some links in the chat as we talk about the different things that you can do to get involved. You can send a letter to your pension fund, follow us on social media, join our organizing groups, and stay tuned for the release of our upcoming Canadian Pension Climate Report card. Uh, so this is a very simple, quick, and effective action that you can take. You can go to shiftyourpension.ca, and you can select the Canada Pension Plan from the drop-down menu and send a letter to the leadership board of the Canada Pension Plan. And you can do this in less than two minutes and add your voice to thousands of Canadians that have already written to the CPPIB. 
You can also work with us individually or as part of one of our organizing groups. For example, other pension members we've worked with have written letters to the editor, submitted op-eds, asked their pension managers to meet with them, launch campaigns with their unions, and have organized with others to send open letters and petitions. Um, Shift, we can support you with uh, research, with sample campaign materials, with information sessions, and we can also keep you informed of key dates and upcoming campaign opportunities. And remember that we've been talking about the Canada Pension Plan today, but we also support beneficiaries of other plans like the Ontario Healthcare Pension, the Ontario Municipal Employees Pension, the University Pension Plan, um, and more. For example, I support public sector workers in BC who are calling on their pension manager to do more on climate. Uh, so here are some examples of media coverage we've seen from pension members speaking about their pensions role in climate change. Uh, so in the top left is an op-ed from healthcare workers in Ontario. Um, in the top right is a CBC feature on pension funds and climate rate change. And then there's also another op-ed and an online action taken by teachers and students calling on the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan to divest from fossil fuels. And we do this because it works. Pension funds are acknowledging the concerns being raised by their members and are acting on it. So this is a quote uh, from an op-ed that the CEO of the Canada Pension Plan wrote after the Canada Pension Plan hosted public meetings in every province in 2022. The, the Canada Pension Plan will be hosting public meetings again this year, and we'll be sure to let you know about the meetings and also provide a list of suggested questions that you can ask. This is another example from the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, which we've been campaigning on for the longest with a fairly large group of members. And in this interview, the pension fund CEO acknowledged that they'd heard very clearly from their members that their members expect them to align with a pathway to reach zero emissions. Um, and we know that there are so many things that an individual can do to take action on climate change. Engaging your pension fund on climate change is one of the most important actions you can take because those retirement savings have a big carbon footprint and much bigger than any of the other individual actions that lots of us already take and that we should take to help protect, protect the planet. Um, so we'll finish up with by asking you a question on a poll, which I think we might actually have to stop sharing in order for the polls to appear, um, but we can we can try that. Uh, so the question is, what will you commit to do to engage your pension fund on the climate crisis? And Adam, do you want us to try to unshare the screen? And see if the poll appears? Yeah, let's see if that works. <laughs> and if it doesn't, that's all good. And we can just put them, we can reshare and see, have everybody look at the options and put their answer in the chat. I, I think we might just have to share results from the first question and I'm able to do that. So... Oh, oh, there Can we you... go. Where's up? There yeah. you go. This is useful for us to know what interest there is in different types of actions. Right. That's great. Lots of answers there. Um, I think, I think the hosts are seeing the results, but no one else. Is, so we could share them. Yeah, I can't see them right now. Okay. In the poll, and then uh, you can yeah, share. Yeah. So I'm gonna uh, share results here, and uh, lots of people willing to send a quick letter to their pension funds and talk to friends and family, share updates, join a shift organizing group, email, like a wide, wide range of actions here. So pension funds are going to be hearing from you in lots of ways, which is great. Um, and now I think what we're going to do from here is turn things over to Terry to help us with the Q&A and discussion. Okay, well, thank you everybody for that for that presentation. I think you've raised a whole series of questions that um, I'm hoping that we're gonna have comments and questions to follow up on. I don't see many things in, in the chat box at the moment. So I'm wondering if people could take 
a few minutes to put any comments or questions that you want to put to any of our presenters in the chat box. And in the meantime, I've got a couple of my own that I that, that the presentation is sort of twigged, and maybe I'll go on to those while you take the opportunity to put a comment or question in the chat box. So I'm curious about uh, Schiff's experience about um, moving fossil fuel companies to become not fossil fuel companies, but to become energy companies. I know that there's been some attempts uh, of fossil fuel companies to rebrand themselves, um, but then it seems that they they do a bit of a a backsliding at the end of the at the end of the day. I know that that happened with Shell, and it's happened with a number of other uh, corporations where they 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 want to appear and they actually do make investments in renewable energy, and then they seem to back away from that and double down on fossil fuels. So, is if, if you've got any 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 sense as to whether or not financial pressure can encourage fossil fuel companies? to actually move out of the fossil fuel sector into renewables? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's one, I think it's maybe at the heart of what we're working on right now in many ways and right at the heart of this conversation because the the biggest challenge that we see is this, this sense that, well, we need everybody to be part of the solution. We all should be moving towards addressing the climate crisis. It's my desk up. Um, and it makes sense. Oil and gas have to be part of the solution. Um, and there are, I think, maybe two examples I can think of in history of of an oil and gas, a pure play oil and gas explorer or producer, a company that's specifically set up to uh, explore for and produce oil and gas, um, making the transition. And the only one that really comes to mind that's that was clear is there was a company in Denmark called Dong Energy, um, that was heavily involved in oil and gas in the North Sea, made a, a whole scale transition to become one of the largest renewable energy companies, that one of the largest offshore wind companies in particular called Orsted. Um, and the reason that that happened is because the Danish government had a huge ownership in it and pushed it in that direction. Um, but it's that happened uh, more than 12 years ago. And I can't think of any other clear examples of uh, an oil and gas company actually becoming an energy company. And investors, you know, I think started very good faith, say, look, we're going to engage. We have a whole policy of engagement. We're going to be really aggressive. We're going to do shareholder votes. We're going to push. Um, and there's this thing called the Climate Action 100 Plus, where they targeted all the world's largest oil and gas companies and pushed hard on Shell and BP in particular. And a number of them set deadlines and said, if by 2023, which at the time, this was 2017, they started doing this engagement. If by 2023, we haven't seen meaningful action, that will divest then, but we're going to stick with them. And we're going to try this. And the result was nothing. You know, the companies talked a good game. And then when when you actually see their books, the percentage of their revenue uh, cash flow flowing towards renewable energy was single digit 1%, 2%. And then Two years ago, we saw Shell and BP both say, we're walking back from our net zero strategies. We're going to keep investing in new oil and gas. The companies are not well set up to uh, become leaders in, in the climate solutions business. So they're just not good at it. They're not experts in it. There's nothing particular about those companies that would make them uh, leaders in that business. And so it's a very unrealistic expectation. Um, there's a lot of technology like carbon capture and storage doesn't do anything to actually transition the company. It might marginally reduce their their production emissions, but it doesn't do anything for the fact that more than 80% of um, the emissions from their products come from burning the product out of their hands. So we basically have to uh, dump these companies and they, they will become stranded assets. So even if you could, in theory, transition them, it would be a very high risk uh, thing to, to keep investing in as the market share for oil and gas declines. I mean, that's my very long answer to that. I obviously have strong opinions, uh, but that's that's it's a really good question and a really good uh, thing to touch on because to this day, a lot of the, the pensions and financial institutions like banks still talk as if that's a, a possible outcome and it's just not. Well, that leads to a, a kind of a second question is that if uh, fossil fuel divestment campaigns are um, 
are they really directed at trying to provide you know direct financial pressure on fossil fuel companies or are they really trying to put pressure on companies that invest in those companies like on investors in order to essentially take away the social license i guess if i could put it that way that fossil fuel companies have and kind of turn it into a a kind of a tobacco thing where investing in that kind of thing is like an investment in really undermining right. fundamental health and, and <laughs> a livable climate. So is it really about uh, on taking away the social license, really, that, that divestment campaigns are focused on? Well, if any of my colleagues want to jump in as well, I have, a, I'll have great answers to all these questions. I'm always really enthusiastic. Um, so feel free. I'm just going to throw in, which is to say, um, yeah, all of the above. Um, it's often said, oh, well, it doesn't have much impact because someone else will just buy the asset and keep running it. But in fact, <clears throat> it does create that social stigma. That's actually quite important in terms of cutting back on the social license. It disconnects the, <clears throat> the interconnections between fossil fuel companies and powerful institutions that are, are very much important in our society. So these pension funds, banks, governments, uh, make a lot of decisions, and there's, all, frankly, too much connection through boards and through other financial connections between fossil fuel companies um, and those institutions, and it's really making climate action much harder. And it's also uh, increasing, what we say is increasing the cost of capital. So if you're a fossil fuel company and you want to expand, you need cheap capital, you need low-cost loans, you need investment in order to do that. And it's increasingly, you know, they're not saying it out loud, but they're they're having trouble right now. Uh, it's hard to get new investment for oil and gas expansion. It's hard to get loans at a low cost, and that actually makes it harder for them to expand. So all of the above is, is sort of the answer there. Okay. There's a question from Keith Hay about the McGill Endowment Fund, too, and, and he had approached the, that fund to divest their fossil fuel investments and got the response, and in some sense, you've already mentioned this, that it's better to influence the fossil fuel industry by remaining as shareholders and trying to get them to, I guess, change their, their colors. Um, you've already said you think that that's not really uh, possible given the, how deep they're into fossil fuel investments. Um, so what kind, you, you know, he, Keith says that Laura partially answered this question, but can you expand on how to respond to the speech, to that specious argument? Uh, what would be the answer that you would have when you're engaging with an endowment fund like this and they're giving you that, that answer for sticking with the fossil fuel sector? I can jump in there, Adam. Great. Yeah. Um. Actually, Adam, if you're able to put up the slide, I think after the thank you slide, I had some some killer quotes from investors that have given up on engagement. Um. Yeah. I th so I think there's a few ways I might approach it. One is if you're like having a positive conversation with the investor or endowment fund, it might be to ask what exactly they are doing to engage. So do they have expectations that the companies that they're engaging with are going to have a, a science-based target? It was the first one, Adam. Sorry, a a, a science-based target yep. um, that aligns with net zero. Are, are they stating that as a clear expectation? And are they saying like, and you need to have it by this date. And if you don't, then we will divest. So um, engage is used by investors to mean all sorts of things. Sometimes it just means we sent them a letter. Like we just sent a letter saying we care about the climate. Um, so I'd really push them on, on what they mean by engage one. It is doubtful, I would say, that the McGill Endowment Fund is doing as much to engage as the pensions on this slide did who tried to engage with fossil fuel companies. So the Church of England Pensions Board led engagement with Shell, Canada, with Shell for a number of years. Um, and did that escalatory pathway, like you need to meet these milestones, otherwise we're going to divest, and eventually did last year saying, this, this is not going to work. We have seen that the fossil fuel industry is not trying to decarbonize um, at the pace that we need. 
And we're going to shift from trying to engage with fossil fuels to engaging in reducing demand. So now they're looking at all the people who burn fossil fuels, all those companies, and trying to reduce demand for fossil fuel companies because they've given up. They've given up on fossil fuel companies. So I would point to like the, the pensions or other investors that have gone that have been doing this for years and then decided that engagement was was not effective for fossil fuels, that they just can't transform their business model. Okay. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, maybe you could take that down um, and we'll move on to another question from Jean Samuel. Um, she's saying that she would like to know how to engage her financial advisor uh, with the issues. She's getting resistance from financial advisors. I presume what that means is resistance from divesting from the fossil fuel sector and I guess taking that and, and moving it into sectors that are more climate friendly. So what would your advice be to uh, to Jean on how to deal with a financial advisor? Yeah, this is a common question and one I've dealt with myself <laughs> talking to a financial advisor. Um, uh, it, within the financial industry, there's very low literacy about climate and a lot of what we showed you tonight, frankly. There are some, I, I'm happy to say that it's growing and it's growing quickly and um, there are more and more financial advisors who have that information, but a substantial amount don't. And so when you mention this, you're immediately getting this sort of blocked reaction. They're, what they're trying to tell you to do is to invest universally in the whole economy to diversify your portfolio for safety. And they think the only way to do that is to invest in all sectors, including energy, traditional energy. Um, but they don't, you know, you don't have to do that. Um, there are a number of financial products available that completely exclude fossil fuels quite easily um, these days. Exchange traded funds with really low management fees. There's lots of ways to do it. Um, and so any financial advisor in 2024 that's giving you a lot of resistance about this, uh, that's a real problem. And I think you, your activism in this case can be to tell them, look, this is 2024. You should know better. You should be able to help me with what I'm asking for. And if you can't, nope, I'm going to have to go to somebody else. That usually lights a fire under financial uh, advisors to try to come back with what you're asking for. But I have to say, it's it's pretty disappointing at this stage to be able to say, hey, I, I'd like to avoid fossil fuels in my investments for risk reasons and for ethical reasons, and for them to not be willing or able to provide you a basic solution. Because I will tell you, those solutions completely exist. They're easy. Um, uh, and they should be able to come back to you absolutely right away. Let me, here you go. I've, I've got ideas for you. So red flag <laughs> is what I would say. Okay, so there's a question. Um, I believe it's from Jim Hollingsworth, Hollingworth, uh, about nuclear power, and and maybe you could say a few things about Schiff's view and uh, how you engage uh, pension funds and trustees of pension funds, pension plan members in talking about nuclear power and whether or not that is a is seen to be a a greener source of energy. Um, it's certainly not you know, at the at the at the generation side of it at you know carbon emitting, but what is what is your experience dealing with questions related to nuclear power? Yeah, this is obviously a very complicated issue. You can do a whole webinar just on nuclear. We always get a good question about it. Uh, shift. We're not we're not anti nuclear. We're not you know uh, we don't tend to take a side on the technology directly. Although we will say it's you know existing nuclear plants have a pretty low carbon footprint. But I will say. In my expertise on energy, it's an exceptionally slow and expensive uh, option if you're talking about something new. So, you know, in terms of the big pension fund that owns nuclear in Ontario is Omer's. Um, they own a big share of Bruce Power. So that's where their primary interest is. Um, and this, it's profitable for them, but it's it's heavily government and, and ratepayer subsidized. Um, and the business model is entirely dependent on future government subsidies as well. So if they're going to expand the Bruce nuclear power plant, it will happen at considerable cost to taxpayers and ratepayers uh, above and beyond what other technologies would have. So there's there's a real risk, I think, um, for pension funds investing in it. The renewable energy is already far cheaper 
renewable, renewable energy and batteries and other kinds of storage are far cheaper and quicker to build and they have a competitive advantage. So unless uh, the nuclear um, industry is able to sort of keep um, government protecting the industry, there's, a, there's actually a real risk in some markets at least that they could be disrupted. So that's all of that to say, um, for new investments for for pension funds, I think nuclear is pretty high risk. Um, but for existing, it, it's probably it's fine. <laughs> That's my really short blunt answer. Other other colleagues might disagree with me. I don't know. Laura, Brett, and anybody want anybody else want to? Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I had a call coming in that I couldn't get rid of fast enough. So. Anyone else, or should I go on to the next question? No, that's like that's okay. I think there's a few other interesting ones that are popping up in the chat here. Yeah, so one of them has to do with um, it, it, what it triggered is a question. It, it said from from Gail Greer, pensioners can't engage or disengage from their pension funds. What strategies are necessary to force those pension plans to change? Is financial regulation enough, or do we need to? to have the Climate Aligned Finance Act uh, to help out that's now before the Senate. Could you maybe comment on, on that a bit? Sure. Um, but we think maybe, pension, to, go ahead, Laura. Uh, Adam, I could take, like, talk a little bit about the first part. Like, yeah, do the first part. Pensioners and can engage, and then you can talk a little bit about regulation. Excellent. Yeah, um, I would just say, I think pensioners can engage with their pension fund. There's a lot that you can do to push a pension fund to change. It's your money and they answer to you. So um, those letters that you send or op-eds or letters to the editor certainly have an effect. Um, I'll just give you an example of something that we did a while back with members of the big public pensions in Canada is um, beneficiaries sent letters to their funds accompanied by a legal opinion on why fiduciary duty included having to, to manage climate related risks. Um, and that got a lot of response. Um, we saw net zero commitments from almost all of the pension funds within a year after those letters. Um, we're seeing movement this year since um, as the as the groups of pensioners that Shift works with are getting larger and sending in more letters and getting more media, um, and this kind of relates to another question I saw from Magdalene as well, like how do we measure progress? In the report that we're putting out this in a couple of weeks, um, we're seeing what we're calling incremental progress. But something that really jumps out is that a year ago there was only one fund that had any sort of screen on new investments in fossil fuels. And that's jumped up to, I think, five funds that have at least some sort of screen or exclusion in one part of their pot portfolio on new fossil fuel investments. So like, we're seeing things happen. So I'm going to say that that's like the effect from the individual pensioners. And then I'll turn it over to Adam to talk about regulation. Yeah. So at Shift, we, we work a lot on the sort of voluntary side in theory. You know, we're pushing the pension to make a voluntary decision to have a, a credible climate plan. Um, but we're also paying attention as well to, to realize that regulation is also going to be needed. So even if we have these great leaders in the pension space, some of them are moving. It, that shows government that it's possible to take these actions and to, to adopt ambitious climate plans. And we need the government to come back and, and force, you know, we need a system where every financial institution and company in the country has a climate plan on the books and reports on it regularly. So it's great, Terry. Thank you for mentioning the Climate Aligned Finance Act. That's a, a piece of legislation written by Senator Rosa Galvez um, that's still moving through the Senate as we speak um, that pro provides the gold standard for what federal regulation would look like. Um, and it does a number of things. It's a bit complicated to get into, but essentially would force financial institutions like pension plans to have, you have to have a credible Paris Aligned Climate Plan. You have to tell us how you're doing on the way. You have to report on it in your financial statements um, and to have that enforced by uh, financial regulators like the Office of uh, Superintendent of Financial Institutions or you know, um, we, there are other layers too. And we're also looking at, at the provincial level regulators because a lot of the pensions we, we actually work on are provincially regulated, not federally regulated. So it's a complicated topic, but we think um, financial regulations 
green standards that prevent greenwashing, all of those sorts of things are, are also going to be essential. But we, we talk about there's a virtuous cycle here between having a strong voluntary climate plan, like from a from a pension plan, and the regulators. So the threat of regulation forces institutions to have more ambitious plans, and those ambitious plans uh, make it easier for the regulator to make their regulations more ambitious. So it's going to take a little bit of time, but I think we're that's the tr the track we're on. Okay, so Magdalene. When, uh, Witteroff asks a, a question that has to do with the boards of, of pension plans. Could you just say a, a couple of things about um, how insulated board members are or how easy it is to get at them and put pressure on them? Is that a function of whether or not boards are really there as a result of some kind of a trusteeship that's being created, you know, and they're, and they're, and they're, they have a a board of trustees that oversees the the pension investment side of things. How do you get access to these board members, and how do you put pressure directly on them? Yeah, it really depends based on the different funds. They're not all the same um, in the way that they're governed. And so, uh, for a lot of the big public pension plans, like we're talking about, uh, say for example, Omers, the sponsors, the individual municipalities. Um, and other workplaces uh, and the unions actually appoint board members to a, a different board than the one that actually makes investment decisions. So they actually have two boards. Um, and those ones, they're called the Sponsors Corporation, and you can meet with them. Um, you can talk to them. You can go through your employer or your former employer or your union. There's lots of ways to get access to them. And so we often send them letters and try to engage with them. Um, the the boards of the individual pension funds that are actually the investment side, they're independent. They're supposed to be at least. So even if they're appointed by your teacher's union or your your uh, hospital, uh, your healthcare workers union, um, they're independent, but there's nothing stopping us from talking to them, trying to educate them. Um, but the route that we've gone through most and had a lot of success with, which is the um, the stakeholder groups, the unions, the actual trustees uh, who are involved in appointing those directors um, can reach out and push. And they those directors really do care about what their stakeholders say. So th they often seem aloof or difficult or inaccessible. But in fact, um, the letters we send, the meeting requests, the media we do, uh, we think has a pretty strong impact on how they operate. And we're already seeing... Uh, as a result of all that work, the directors um, seeking out climate experts to come and present to their boards. We've heard about that. Um, so there's quite a bit of potential for, for pushing that. And one other thing I'll throw in there, which is we are also looking at trying to get the fossil fuel link directors on pension boards uh, removed and to try to educate the sponsors who appoint direct directors to not continue appointing fossil fuel entangled directors in the future. And for example, with teachers unions in Ontario, um, explaining why it's important that they not do that for their own benefit. And I think that's that's going well as well. So there's other ways to influence directors. Canada Pension Plans directors are appointed by federal cabinet. So if that gives you some insight into how to influence those appointments, um, take so that as you will. So I just wanted to mention to people that there will be a resource list coming out uh, in the next day or so, um, and that will contain a list of resources and 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 materials that you might want to use to go deeper into a particular topic that you hear discussed tonight. It'll also list the um, act, the resources and tools that are available from SWIFT and the connections to the SWIFT website. I noticed that Laura has put a number of references in the chat box already in answer to a question from, I believe it was Kate Porter who wanted to, to know where she could get access to resources and tools to, to, to share on social media. And, and Laura responded by putting a number of links in the, in the chat box. We will be, be sort of uh, harvesting all of the references in the chat box and adding them to um, our draft resource list, and everybody will be getting that, like I say, either tomorrow or the day after. So um, I'm just looking now to see um, what other things are in the chat box that we have not talked a little bit about. We did talk about 
um, the nuclear side of things. Um, we we did talk a little bit about how to communicate with board members. Um, we talked about financial advisors. Yes, we talked, and, and I just mentioned that there is printed material that's going to be available or printable material that would be available on the shift website. And I don't know, Laura, are you watching the chat too? Is there something that I've missed that I would, that we haven't talked a little bit about yet? Um, I, 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 there's a lot in there. Yes. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get it all, but I think we've covered everything here. Uh, there is a comment about uh, whether or not, there is something from uh, from shift or if there's a campaign to support the uh, that the act that the that is being uh, that's at the Senate now in terms of uh, what is it called again the financial the climate, climate aligned finance act climate finance act uh, climate aligned finance act is there a campaign that's out there that people could tie into that's expressing support for that act and trying to encourage uh, the Senate to pass it. Is it the Senate that is 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 uh, the holdup in terms of passing it? It's cleared the House of Commons, and I take it that this is the last stage before it becomes law. No, it's it's uh, it's going the other way. Ah, okay. It's uh, it's started in the Senate, and the hope is that it will pass in the Senate, and um, the parts that are relevant to the House side will be adopted on that side. It's a bit complicated, but uh, it's at third reading, so they're they're at the point of trying to get it to actually final vote in the Senate uh, sometime in the next year, we hope. Um, Environmental Defense Canada, another advocacy organization that we work with sometimes, um, it has been running an action tool specifically in support for CAFA. And we can add that to the, I'll find the, the link for it and we can add that to the resource list that gets shared. Because um, it's absolutely important to uh, not only support it in the Senate, but to also send a, a note to your MP saying this is an important piece of legislation that needs to be adopted. Okay, so there's one one question that we didn't address directly. It's from Katie Porter or Kathy Porter having to do with government enforcing a reduction of emissions by imposing penalties on the one hand and incentives on the other. Well, that's really happening big time with the emission uh, framework for cuts to the oil and gas sector. Um, is there any any way in which pension funds can be encouraged to participate in the request or the demand for stronger regulation uh, to be put in place with respect to emission reductions? Do you see any action on that front? And is that worth paying attention to? Yeah, that's um, that's something that's coming out as a, a theme in our in our forthcoming report card is we're going to talk about how pension funds, um, if they're fulfilling this fiduciary duty to plan members, they need to be looking for the most effective actions they can take for a climate safe future and advocating for climate aligned policy that's in line with a net zero pathway as part of that. And we don't see very much of it. We're gonna, um, we'll call attention to a couple examples where we do see pension funds starting to move that way and recognizing that it's the responsibility. But for sure, that is something the funds can be pushed on. Um, we have seen most funds uh, express support for disclosure. So for companies to disclose information about how they are handling climate related risks or disclose information about their greenhouse gas emissions. But that's a far cry from having a, a credible climate plan and a way to deal with it. Um, so we do have examples of two of the pension funds we track that wrote a letter to the government, not quite in support of the oil and, and gas emissions cap, because I, I think they were trying to avoid being partisan. They didn't want to come right out and say that they supported it. So um, there was language about how they, they encouraged the government to use whatever regulatory tool it had at its disposal to achieve these outcomes. Um, so certainly it's something we're going to be calling on pension funds more to do and, and asking you as pension fund members to, to ask for the same. And Adam, I think you just found the link to that environmental defense action. So this is a campaign um, that you can sign on in, sort, in support of getting the Climate Aligned Finance Act uh, through the Senate. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's in, that's in the chat box now. So we'll also include that in the resource list that we send out uh, in the next day or so. Okay, so 
Um, I don't see another question, but look, one occurs to me again with respect to the balance between encouraging pension funds to not do some things and encouraging them to actually invest in things that we want to support. Um, and and I guess I'd like to get your sense of the of the success that you've had or that pension plan members have had in uh, not the negative side of the campaign, stop doing this, but invest in this, please. And these are kind of like directed investments in things that are going to actually help to lower emissions and address the climate emergency. What's your experience on that front? Yeah, I would say that's a pretty good news story. Um, and since shift started, I think what we've found is that the most effective route here is education. When we're talking about climate solutions, they're actually, the opportunities are very good, uh, very low risk, uh, very potentially profitable um, investments of all types are available across the global economy right now. But the, you need expertise. You need to actually want to, to be able to invest in it. You need to be able to be good at it. And so pension funds have to actually have staff who know how to find value and build a renewable renewable energy project. They need to know, oh, we need to understand the battery industry and where we can build a new battery plant or those sorts of questions. So they actually need to put time and effort in. And we, I think in educating them on the opportunity, have had a lot of influence over um, the scale of the investment. So we can't, we, nobody can force pension funds to make specific investments. That's not how it works. They have total independence to make those decisions and for good reason. Um, but I think educating them in terms of, hey, this is the direction of travel. Um, this is where future profitability is. It's been something that's been powerful. So we've seen uh, a number of commitments from, from some of our leading pension funds towards allocating 20% of their total assets under management to climate solutions. We've seen a couple of recent commitments to that. And we've seen pretty high numbers in terms of uh, the solutions investments coming forward. So that's one of the good news stories um, we can point to and say, this is growing. It's not maybe growing as quickly as, as it should, um, but I, I think it's generally the pension funds are starting to wake up to this and to, to get good at it. But you can imagine they have whole teams of people who are really good at finding oil and gas uh, value and buying up companies um, in the oil and gas industry, they have like a dedicated team to that, but they might not yet have uh, somebody who's good at offshore wind uh, projects, for example. And so that's a, that's a slow shift for them to make. So there's a related question from Gail Greer about lawsuits against pension funds for breach of duty of uh, for fiduciary responsibility duties. I used to be when I was a pension trustee a long time ago, that the Scargill decision loomed large with respect to basically saying that, you know, your job is to get the highest rate of return um, financially and that you really ought not to pay attention to other kinds of considerations. Um, I noticed that Laura's put some, some uh, links to lawsuits in Australia in the chat box, but I, I'm curious about whether or not the decisions with respect to fiduciary responsibility are recognizing that, you know, that, the problem with stranded assets in the oil and gas sector means that it is actually exercising your fiduciary responsibility to avoid putting your investments in sectors that are going to be high risk and they're at risk of, of, of you know, as the climate emergency gets worse. Could you could you say a few words about that kind of thing? Are, are pension plans gun shy still with respect to putting, uh, you know, investment criteria in place that stays away from the oil and gas sector? Or has that changed substantially? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, when I've been doing, working at Shift for five years now, and when I started, we were seeing a lot of pension funds say we couldn't possibly change our investment strategy on this because of fiduciary responsibility. And it took a long time and working with a lot of legal colleagues and lawsuits like the one that Laura just published, uh, put, put in the chat there. That's a specific lawsuit in Australia against the rest pension um, over fiduciary responsibility. To, to have the pensions realize, oh, this is very much a financial decision, not, not an ethical one, and it's one that's well within the bounds of our legal obligations. And that's partly why Shift, as Laura mentioned, sent legal letters to all of these funds with a legal opinion that said, this is your legal responsibility. The purpose of that letter was partly to remind them that you are exposed to 
to potential lawsuits. Um, any fund that doesn't stay on top of this climate risk could be sued um, quite rightly for breach, breach of fiduciary duty. Um, and we're seeing a number of other uh, directors, specifically in the UK, a, a couple of directors are being sued for exactly this. Um, and these lawsuits are picking up steam. So all of that to say, uh, yeah, it's it's been a, a very big logical uh, change for the whole industry over the last five years to come to realize that not only is fiduciary responsibility uh, covering climate, but it actually requires them to act. And I think that's, we're sort of on, maybe on the downhill part of that slope now where uh, it's now becoming increasingly difficult to show how, how uh, fossil fuels fit within a framework of fiduciary responsibility given the headwinds. We, we just saw a report from the International Energy Agency this year, uh, very, very respected, um, the most respected energy modeling agency in the world saying they expect demand for coal, gas, and oil, all three, to occur before 2028. So four years from now. And so the, the impact that that has on global markets is something that it's very, it's increasingly difficult for pensions to ignore and trustees to ignore. So um, I think we've got a little bit of wind in our back on this one. And I also noticed that I, I if I remember correctly, your, your, your slide presentation, that there was a, there's good evidence that in fact, the 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 money that is used when you divest from the oil and gas sector and invest in other sectors, the rate of return is actually higher than what would have been earned if you had kept them in the oil and gas sector. So there's good there's good evidence to to indicate that that's a good decision to get out of the oil and gas sector and get into other sectors of the economy that are that are less carbon intensive. Opportunity costs, as they say. Yeah. Okay, I noticed that Laura's also put some uh, some resources related to Canada in terms of the legal the legal issue that we were just talking about. So, okay, well, we're almost at 8.30 and I don't see any more questions or comments in the chat box. So I think we'll probably uh, call it a night there and I'm, I'm going to sort of end the Q&A period. I wanna thank uh, all three of you it, I think it was really a, a very helpful presentation, really good information. And I think that this has given a whole bunch of people some tools that they can go to town on. And as I say, the resources will be coming out uh, in the, the resource list will be coming out in the next day or so. So people who want to take and are in a position to take some action will have access to the tools to do that. So thank you very much for uh, for your presentation tonight and providing us with uh with both uh, the analysis of the problem, but also some ways in which we can become active in trying to identify solutions. So Christine, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to you for some final final comments. Okay. And uh, again, we'd like to thank Adam, Laura, and Britt for all your great, in, your interesting presentation, very informative. And I'd like to thank Terry also for curating the question and answer session. Lastly, I would like to thank everyone who has renewed their Environment Halliburton membership. It is your memberships and donations that enable us to keep working to protect what we love here in Halliburton. If you're interested, new memberships, renewals, donations can be made through our membership and donations page on our website at www.environmenthalliburton.org. Thanks again for joining us tonight, and we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Have a good evening. Good night.